Dolu dolu dolu. Ne ona çimene tavla minis. Çıda çimene yanında de var be. Hamiyon söyleyin baba insan. Good morning. 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 Thank you. 
Thank you. Sit down. Thank you. Firstly, I want to express my greetings and welcome. <laughs> this is almost the first time and welcome. This is a meeting with scientists, mainly. Uh, this is almost Chinese first scientists. Time. Chinese. This is a meeting uh, with scientists, mainly. Uh, uh, actually, this kind of meeting, now over 30 years. I have sort of meeting with scientists. And then, mainly, you see the Western scientists, Westerner. You, some American, some Europeans, and occasionally some Indian. But now this is first time meeting, meeting with scientists from uh, Chinese community. I want to I mean, to also the, to explain the very purpose of this kind of meeting. Two purpose. Number one, simply expand our knowledge and particularly the field of uh, scientific research. I think till later part of 20th century, I think their main sort of field concentrate is external thing. And when I mentioned mind, some of them reject uh, just a brain. Beside the brain, no mind. <laughs> I'm wondering, do you believe, uh, I mean, do you have the concept mind something separate from brain or not? <laughs> so, 
so scientific sort of research field, I think uh, it is not sufficient, just external thing. The pains and pleasure, anger, or compassion, this uh, not just a mere brain, but mainly mind. So therefore, now scientific sort of the research field should include about mind. And now, later part of the 20th century, now some scientists, brain specialists, now they begin to feel there is something which affect our brain. Kasa, brain Kasa. Plasticity. Yeah. For example, like the discovery of plasticity has really changed the neuroscience. Mm. Because of the training our mind, some people who have some sort of ability to concentrate without moving their mind, there's some change in their brain. The brain. So now begin the scientists also, the showing, some scientists showing uh, interest. And as a matter of fact, some scientists now start some research work. Like one American scientist, a brain specialist, the, uh, the subtle mind. There are some indication uh, some cases, brain dead, the heart beating stop, then blood circulation cease. So then, within a short period, brain dead. But the person's body still remains very fresh, including my own teacher. After that, clinically, as a day. Recognized as a dead person, now dead. Uh, but he, his body remained very fresh next 13 days. And similar cases, some two weeks, some three weeks. So now, this is something phenomena we are seeing. So now, uh, the Buddhist tradition, we have some sort of explanation. The scientist uh, say not yet sort of stay because uh, of the have understand the or have the explanation for or, this phenomenon. So Richard Davidson, Wisconsin University, uh, he already uh, initiated no? sort of or say they developed some kind of project, project to investigate such case. Uh, so, so that's purpose, number one purpose is simply scientific sort of research now should expand material, external things as well as internal or mind. Experience. No. Uh, then uh, the scientific knowledge then becoming more fuller. Now, the second purpose is now uh, in spite a uh, lot of sort of or say the development in scientific sort of research and knowledge and with that technology now highly developed, very useful. But many of these uh, Scientific sort of finding, I mean, result out of scientific research, like nuclear bomb <laughs> <laughs> and many weapons. Oh, so uh, the knowledge, the science, unfortunately, use destructive way that brings 
more fear. The nuclear sort of or the weapon itself or and Newton bomb. Oh wonderful. But the very purpose of these things is killing. So it is quite unfortunate. So now, uh, uh, and then the people, uh, the scientists who carry sort of uh, sort of research work, they found constant anger uh, is, you see. Uh, very harmful for our health. Anger actually eating our immune system. Some scientists say that. So more compassionate mind, it automatically bring more calm mind, more peaceful mind. So very important for our own health. And I think here, I think all the people, I think, uh, prefer smile face, isn't it? Uh, I think nobody prefer. <laughs> <laughs> I think hero's face. <laughs> no hesitation to kill. <laughs> oh, I think nobody prefer. You see that kind of expression. That's human nature. Even dogs. I notice, you see, dogs, when you, while you are giving some food, you show smile and affection. They also appreciate, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, some birds, although you may give something, uh, without showing the human affection, they take the thing, then go. Uh, if you show human affection, dogs, Oh, you see, they, they are tail, you see, doing like that. They, they really sh showing a like sort of response to us. More closeness feeling. So now, uh, all major religious tradition carry the message of love. Oh, with that uh, message of forgiveness, tolerance, uh, uh, but uh, friendly speaking, effect from religious tradition limited. In modern time, the, I notice some uh, temples or monastery in Europe or in America, a big monastery, uh, now almost empty. So you see people sort of showing interest about religion less and less. So, so now in the education field, we should include, now these days I'm telling, I'm expressing, the, in our education uh, should include, beside hygiene of physical, we should have hygiene of emotion. That we really need, without touching religion. Not talking about heaven or some other things. Simply, how to uh, carry healthy body, healthy mind. Too much emotion here, anger, very bad for our health. So now, uh, uh, The way to promote this inner value, if you, uh, based on religious belief, the effect limited, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the, as I mentioned earlier, it's a scientific sort of, out of scientific research, they say anger is very bad for our health. Uh, then, some scientists say, uh, Basic human nature is more compassionate. It also, you see, if we, if we use common sense, then 
all seven billion human beings come from their mother. Uh, and they survived with mother's affection, mother's milk. Uh, then in young, young child, uh, young children, I think they don't care what is difference, what is national differences, or what is religious differences, or even with believer or non-believer, not much so. Uh, pay attention. So long, children each other play together, smiling. You see, they feel very happy. Then gradually, we grown up mm, through our education. Then, you see, the existing education, I feel very much materialistic oriented. So not much talking about these deeper human inner value. So now in any case, it is quite clear. Now in education, we should include, you see, education about how to bring inner peace and through that way, how to create healthy body. So now, uh, I am Buddhist. To my own practice, yes, some of Buddhist sort of practice, very helpful. That I cannot share with other people. The co- Se- out of seven billion human beings, about one billion non-believer. And then uh, about six billion believer. We kind of what to say we already observed a lot of uh, troublemaker among the believer. <laughs> Isn't it? They say the very thing which they believe use you see division and killing. Unthinkable. Whether you believe religion or not, up to individual. But once you accept religion, then you should be serious about your religious tradition. Then all major religious tradition carry the message of love, forgiveness, tolerance, uh, self-discipline. They use different method. Some say in philosophical field. There are differences. Some say there is creator, there is God. Some say no God. It's a different method. Uh, I always telling, you see, we cannot say, uh, pick up one medicine and then say this medicine is best. You cannot say. According to the patient's physical condition, illness, age, climate, then you can also, also, Re- recommend. 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 Your case, this medicine is best. Similarly, among the human beings, there are many different mental disposition, and due to different culture, different environment. Therefore, you see, you, we need different way of approach in order to promote this deeper inner value. Uh, so, so now, the. Uh, non-believers, I feel the what's the explanation, the importance of these inner values such as compassion, warm heartedness. Uh, if you based on religion, then not much effect to these people. So, on the basis of uh, scientific finding, they will pay more attention. Now here, according Indian tradition, we usually you see describing also the secular ethics without religious belief. Uh, simply, you see, they explain this deeper value. So, uh, Alex. Oh, uh, Alex, you once told me the very word of secular is not nice. 
and also some Muslim friend, you see, they told me. So in the West, the meaning of secular means disrespect or distance from religion. But in this country, India, secular means respect all religions and also respect non-believer. I think that way of thinking, uh, that, that, meaning, that, huh? that, that way to understand secular means, I think, are useful. Uh, secular ethics, you see, they showing respect all religions and then also non-believer. So now, uh, in order to uh, promote about our inner value through education, only way is secular way. So I usually used to follow that way. So now, scientific sort of research or scientific finding is something very useful, as I mentioned already. People more convinced, convinced scientific science rather than religion. Okay. Like that. So that's uh, number two, because of the purpose. Purpose, no, of, uh, second purpose. Uh, second, second purpose. purpose. Sort of, uh, So then, uh, in the past, I think over 20 years, I think, you saw the scientific meeting. More than 30 times. Mind alive, mind alive, yeah. I must introduce other people. This lady, the late Verala's wife. Francisco Varela, yeah. Hmm. The Verala, a uh, great scientist, also, you see, he usually say, uh, when he explains something about pure science, then he say, now with my s scientific cape. Cape. Cap. Cap. Oh. Then sometimes he refer Buddhist, Buddhist concept. So then he say, now I wear Buddhist cap. <laughs> So great, really great. I think mainly her late husband, I think really was a start of this, this meeting. Oh, no, no. This this dialogue series. Oh. So, mm. so in the past, no, over now 30 times back. Yeah, yeah. Over 30 dialogues. Oh, dialogue, mainly Europeans and some Indian. Occasionally, some Chinese. Oh, Westerners, no? Oh, okay. I'm a Westerner, so yeah, oh, no. Westerner. And then, a uh, few months ago, uh, when I uh, give teaching some Taiwanese Buddhist, then they, when I met organizer, so one Taiwanese, I'm wondering, that person here or not? Kure. Oh, you? Oh, I see. Right there. Oh, he quantum physicist. And he, you see, introduced himself as a quantum physicist. Then I thought, oh, now we are going to have one meeting about quantum physics from Chinese scientist. So now, you mentioned that. So now, uh, that word, no physical, but that word brings now this opportunity. <laughs> Law of causality. Right? Yeah. Uh, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. Uh, so, so now I'm really very, very happy meeting with a uh, sci scientist, mainly Chinese, uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, and I welcome one Nobel 
what's the day? Laureate Lam. Laureate. Thank you. And this morning I met, you see, his age, uh, 82. I'm 83. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so now another sort of thing I want to explain. When I met the Western scholars and discussed about, you see, these, uh, including quantum physics or psychology or these things, uh, sometimes I feel little because of the uh, hesitant, 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 hesitant yeah. uh, because the uh, and Western or or say the scientist, their cultural background uh, something different. So the concept of creator. Uh, so therefore, you see. Uh, if we go detail evolution, the whole world, whole galaxies come from particle. Uh, and go that way, evolution way, is sometimes it's difficult. With too much emphasis on that, I feel uncomfortable. Because I respect all religion. And I really admire uh, Judo Christian tradition. The millions of people get immense inspiration. Uh, last thousand years and even today, so in the future also, it will remain. So therefore, uh, uh, and particularly, I'm uh, fully committed to promotion of religious harmony. So therefore, uh, out of my sort of genuine respect, you see, there are sort of philosophical view. So sometimes a little sort of concern or feel uncomfortable. The Westerner, mainly due to Christian sort of uh, background, background. So it is better to keep their own way. Now, Asia, something different now. Mm. Uh, and particularly Chinese. Uh, many Chinese are Buddhist. Wherever Chinese community there in America or uh, in Europe, Chinese community, bigger Chinese community, like Vietnamese community, some Buddhist temple. So, quite familiar. Uh, and then, uh, and the Chinese Buddhist tradition, Tangsen, Kasa, Tangsen, Kasa. Tangsen, so he came to India and spent some time in Nalanda. And according to some sort of historian, uh, he met uh, Nakabudi. 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 So when he met Nakabudi, uh, Nakabudi, of course, the uh, direct dis because of disciple of Nagarjuna, and Nagabodhi, when he met, very, very old. So in any way, uh, and many Chinese Buddhist, uh, the name of Lungsu Pusa. Lungsu Pusa. Familiar? Huh? So, so therefore, you see, the, you uh, traditionally, uh, you see, they are very close with Nalanda tradition. And particularly, Lungsu Pusa's tradition. So, therefore, uh, I'm very happy having this meeting. Uh, in the political field, over a thousand years, sometimes we fight each other. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes remain very, very close uh, relations through sort of marriage. marriage. The seventh, the seventh, century. Uh, seventh century, the Song Zengkabo marry Chinese princess, like that. Uh, so, uh, in any way, 
the reality, we have to live side by side. Whether this is creator or not, it, 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 it becomes like that. So, much better live side by side happily. Oh. So, therefore, political field now, uh, uh, now since 74, you see, we decided not seeking independence of Tibet. Oh. We very much sort of committed to remain within the people's world of China. So therefore, uh, and then, you see, they uh, remain politically, remain within the people's world of China, provided we should have all the right which mentioned in the Constitution, including our language on these things. Then it is mutual benefit. So Tibet, materially backward, so remain within the people of China. We get plenty of money, <laughs> so we can build, isn't it, material field. At the same time, the number of Chinese Buddhists now already around 400 million Buddhist population in China, mainland China. Uh, we can help them. We can share our knowledge. Now, today's world, as far as Nalanda tradition, knowledge about the Nalanda tradition, I found that we Tibetan kept Nalanda tradition. Because uh, of the... Alive, Lam. Because uh, oh, intact. Uh, intact. Uh, intact. Uh, intact. So therefore, you see, uh, we can help you to, how should I say, to, to explain about Nalanda tradition, like that. So, now, beside the political field, the environment also, Tibet, uh, one Chinese environmentalist, uh, he wrote one article. He mentioned to me, uh, Tibetan plateau uh, is very important for uh, global warming. So he described Tibetan plateau is third ball. The effect from Tibetan plateau, global warming, as much as South Pole and North Pole. So he described uh, Tibetan plateau is third pole. So now, the Yangtze River, Mekong River, the Dichu, Machu, Marwe, oh. Uh, these are the big major river, original source from Tibet. Uh, so the environment about Tibet is something we really need, I think, special pay attention for preservation of Tibetan sort of environment. Very important. So, so now, finished. <laughs> so, so it's my turn to speak. Hmm? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting us, physicists, to come here to engage in the discussion of quantum physics and Buddhism. I really appreciate this opportunity for myself. Yeah. Working yeah. over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or quantum physics and Buddhism. I really appreciate this opportunity for myself. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Over. For quantum physics and Buddhism. I really appreciate this opportunity for myself. I'm very happy to see you again. We have seen so many times in Petra 
Jordan, mm-hmm. the mandate for the peace for the Middle East. Well, as you know, when you are talking about have to be happy, smile, smiling all the time, with all the physicists sitting there, only two on this side are smiling. The others are really <laughs> very, very serious. We don't learn to smile very much. So this is uh, something we really... I usually, you see, when, when I meet people, hmm, I smile. Yes. Most cases, they also respond smile. Yeah. Uh, if response, not smile, then I do this. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Then automatically smile comes. <laughs> <laughs> so Wonderful. I think you need <laughs> well um, it is quite interesting we, we are scientists we, you came here it's called scientists and very often people would ask Dr. Lee what do you mean by science in one of the international gathering in Rio de Janeiro when we were discussing global warming, one person raised their hand, said, what is science? And there's an interesting question there. You can spend time to explain what is science. But actually, I do believe science is a language, a language to communicate with nature, communicate with nature. So like quantum mechanics, we learn how to communicate with the tiny little particle, which is the dualism, wave nature and particle natures. So science is really a language. So we learn the language, and so we're quite serious. This is just like learning Tibetan language, science is another language. I consider, you see, as far as I understand about science, science means you see, investigate what's the reality. Oh. So, uh, not content. Yeah. Walking yeah. over. Walking yeah. over. Yeah. Walking yeah. over. Yeah. So, Lusupusa. Yeah. Oh. In his right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. The Nalendu tradition, Lusu Pusa. Yeah. Oh? In his writing, not accept it easily, but investigate, investigate. Yeah. So a language become richer and richer. At the same time, scientists, when they try to communicate with nature, they also believe in two things. One thing is, we are part of nature. We, all of us are part of nature. So in communicating with nature, we certainly will look into the phenomena of life, evolution, well, the other important thing is scientists always based on the evidence. So we could say evidence-based judgment, evidence-based decision. Well, there are some things could be quite complicated. You did mention about brain and mind. And when you ask me, do you believe in the separation of brain and mind? I say, yes. Do you know why? Because very often, after dinner, my wife and I sit together. 
we married for more than half a century mm. already. Happy yeah. marriage. Yes. <laughs> yes, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> but before I say anything, she already read my mind. <laughs> so before I say anything, she will say, oh yes, yes, why don't you do this? You want to go play tennis tonight, go ahead and do it. And all those are in my mind, but I didn't have to speak out. She already read all my mind. Okay? So in her brain and in my mind, there are something communicating. So I will not simply say brain and mind are just one thing. But when I said we are part of nature, so we are investigating, trying to learn to communicate with all kinds of things, biological phenomena or psychological things. Those are what scientists have been doing. And scientists always believe that what we found, the new discovery, will bring benefit to mankind. But on the other hand, you have seen that science advances in certain country, just before the first world war, colonialism. Mm -hmm. The developed country will take, take charge and invade uh, not well developed countries. And those kind of things will cause scientists to reflect the, the social responsibility of science. And most recently, because of the advancements of science, population exploded. And per capita consumption keep on growing. I mean, so there is this overload now. You're talking about scientists invent nuclear bomb, bombing the, the, the uh, enemies. But now what we are doing is we have already changed the environment such that more energy coming in from the sun than getting out from the earth. So the entire earth is getting warm, warmer and warmer, and extreme weather event is starting to influence us. And suddenly, we know we are in a finite system. Earth is a finite system. Finite. So when you look at the tiny little particle, you have the wave natures. But if you have a boundary condition, and the size of the boundary is quite similar to the wavelength, then for establishing stationary wave, energy level will be quantized, quantized. So humanity, now we reach the limit of boundary condition we cannot exceed. And that is one of the things I spend most of my time working on it and worry about the future of humanity. So, in a sense, it's interesting. I trained as a chemist. But when I became the president of the academy in Taiwan, we do have the Institute of Astronomy, History, Humanity, and 30 institutes. Then I suddenly had to change my position from chemist to a scientist to a scholar. And supposed to be able to take care of everybody and learn things together with all of us. And today it's interesting, we, we are talk, talking about quantum mechanics. And from the discovery of quantization, quantum mechanics, and humanity, and religion, we have much to learn from you. So we came here, it's open-minded, we do depend on evidence, we believe if there is evidence, if there's no evidence, we might not accept. Yeah. Humility. Humility. 
So, no? yes. So I said, we have open mind, try to learn from you how the science, nature, humanity, and religion, all of those are connected. Humanity, sir. Okay. No. Okay. So the purpose of our meeting I already mentioned. Then, now over 30 years, nearly 40 years, the meeting with scientists. Uh, at the beginning, there was some my friend. Uh, so express to me, expressing to me, oh, be careful, science is killer of religion. <laughs> uh, then I thought, no, science, as I mentioned earlier, investigate the one method to investigation. What is reality? <coughs> so then immediately I felt no, I, 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 so I express in Tibetan. Kelon Dagam Kyanan, the Secretary of Session, Lekordala Ngayika, Lama Chai, Christian means. So, when this person talked about the science being a killer of religion and, you know, His Holiness should be careful, it immediately reminded him of a statement uh, attributed to the Buddha, which says that all monks and scholars uh, don't accept of my words simply because out of devotion and reverence but you should accept it on the basis of having examined just as a good goldsmith would accept a gold by first testing it out. So, the, as I already mentioned, those Nalanda uh, Buddhist master, the some Buddha's own teaching, they already rejected. So I also follow that. We Buddhist, particularly Tibetan Buddhist, we very much sort of love to offer mandala. Yeah, there's a, a, a particular ritual a practice called offering the mandala, offering the universe. Oh, yeah. so the world flat uh, and in the center Mount Miru, then the sun and the moon, same level, go around the mountain. Around. So here you see day and the night happen, the sun other side of Mount Meru, uh, Mount Meru. Mm. then this site become dark. So, I think a uh, thousand years, mm. we believe that as a result of meeting with the scientist, the world is round. <laughs> uh, uh, the sun and the moon, not the same level, big differences. Moon, but much closer. Sun, very far, very far. Oh, the light year, Jikshi. With so many light years. Mm -hmm. Like that. Uh, so then size of sun and moon, big differences. But some of this literature says more or less same Better. size. Uh, so, okay, okay. Oh, so therefore, you see, I already rejected <laughs> the flat world yes. and Mount Miru. Yes. So I'm quite sinful. Your <laughs> 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 So His Holiness is sometimes a little worried because they are very devout Tibetan Buddhists, especially the elder generation, who may have done this ritual practice hundreds of thousands of times, which involve imagining the universe in this particular form and making offerings to the Buddha. So some of them might be thinking, you know, the Dalai Lama says there is no such thing as Mount Meru, so what has happened to all this practice I've done? <laughs> your, your Holiness. When we met last time in Petra, surrounded by many young students, they ask you one question, and what do you mean by happiness? And you give a very good answer. I still remember, remember it. Do you still remember what you answer? 
<웃음> 레이 아버지 요사를 라오 데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데데
is the same. It doesn't feel any change. But if I tilt the ball, tilt, tilt the table on the one side, then the positions are different for the ball. Some positions are higher, some positions are lower. And so the ball starts to move. Okay. So this is the relation between symmetry and interaction. A particle in motion possesses charge. Okay. Charge is the generator of change of state. Okay. When this state is the particles or the object's position, the charge is called momentum. So if the particle has momentum, its position will change. A particle at rest has zero charge, it has no charge. The charge of an isolated particle does not change when the position change due to the symmetry of its state because every position is the same for, for it. So when it change position, its charge remains the same. Okay. Only when I break symmetry... Okay, so only when I break symmetry, for example, by tilting the table, there will be a force and its charge will change. Okay. Now, there is another important uh, ingredient in classical mechanics, which is charge, which is the generator of change, and the state are dual to each other, which means if I call momentum the state, then its charge, its, its position, they change. Okay. So these three points, one is law of inertia, the other is the symmetry breaking with interaction, and the third is the duality between charge and state, are the core of classical mechanics. No, so then your charge is not the electric charge. No, no, it's the, it's the generator of change. Okay. And so, as I said, charge generates change of state. Yeah. So if state is position, the charge is momentum. If state is the object's time, the charge is energy. So if the object has positive momentum, its position will change in this direction. If it has negative momentum, its, its position will change in the other direction. If the object has positive energy, its time will change in this direction. If the object has negative energy, its time will change in the other direction. A massive particle, okay. a massive particle with zero momentum will stand still, but it will move forward in time because it has positive energy. When we were born, we all had positive energy, so our time moved in one direction. In order for the time to move, in order for the time to stand still, a particle has to have zero energy and hence zero mass. Since change of state is a symmetry operation, the particle coronary energy manner. Change of state. As I say, if you change the particle's position, we call it a translation. You can change its position or time. It's a translation. Change of state is the symmetry operation. Since charge is generator of change of state, charge is called a generator of symmetry operation. Now I come to the second statement of law of inertia. Newton's law of inertia. It said that 
an object that is in motion will not change its velocity. So it's it. compared to first. The first said that the position is the same for this particle, all position the same. The second said that all velocity the same for this particle. That's why when it has this velocity, it will not change. However, changing the velocity is different from changing position. You cannot just move the velocity to another velocity. You can rotate the velocity, change its direction. But to change its magnitude, you have to do it the right way. That's what Einstein find out. Okay. How to change uh, for an isolated magic particle, it does not know its magnitude. Like if we, if we sit in a train which moves smoothly, you close your eyes, you don't know if you are moving. Okay. But if you, you think you are standing still, but if you open your eyes and look out the window, you saw the trees moving backwards fast. Then you think, okay, maybe I'm moving with respect to the tree. Okay. So how do you generate the change of velocity? Einstein find the correct way based on work of Lorentz. Okay. So if a particle is standing still, its position does not move, but time moves. Okay. So he moves along this line. Okay. He has zero velocity. So this is the slope with respect to the time axis is the velocity. We count velocity using the unit of light speed. Uh, so here you have this, this line equal to this line, the 40 degree side, and you have a square. Now, in order to change velocity, you just change the scale of this 45 degrees lines. So I can change, increase, stretch this line by twice. And I compress this line by a factor of two. Then the area remains the same. A square becomes a rectangle, but the area remains the same. But now the particle will move along this, along this line, and it has a velocity, because when time changes, its position changes, and it has a slope. If I change the relative scale more, velocity so if you change the relative scale, relative scale of these 42, 45 degree line more, its velocity will move more toward the velocity of light. So what Einstein said is that all the velocity are the same for the isolated particle, but you can never change it to the velocity of light. Only massless particle move with the velocity of light, which is the slope one. Okay. So, so you have three generators to change the velocity. You can boost it along one direction, along the other direction, and along the third direction. So you have three generators to change velocity, the magnitude of velocity, and you have three generators of rotation to change its direction. So there are a total of six charges, six generators, of uh, changing the velocity. These are called Lorentz symmetry. Okay. They generate the change of velocity. Okay. For an isolated particle, all velocity are the same to it. Okay. So classically, as I said, breaking symmetry, these two forces. If you have a test particle here and it's isolated, it has translation symmetry. You can translate in space, in time. It has rotation symmetry. All directions are the same to it because it's isolated. Okay. And it does not know its velocity, just like when we are sitting in the train, close our eyes. Okay. But when you put a source here, then you break the symmetry. The test particle, not all positions are the same because it can know its position and time with respect to 
Tu ce rând dină să vorbești? Nu, dar ce? Ca glo. Relative position. position then okay. this particle is no longer isolated. The test particle know its position and time relative to the bigger one. Bigger one, yeah. And so translation symmetry is broken, and he know the direction because it, you have a direction to this uh, matchup, another matchup one. So you know the direction, and you know the velocity because if this particle is raised, you know you are moving, moving with respect to it. Okay. But you break all this symmetry. If break symmetry, there should be force. Okay. So that's what Einstein said, velocity is relative. Okay. Once it, if, if you are isolated, you don't know your velocity. But if there's another particle there, symmetry breaking and you know your velocity. And you go say the Pinsun Tun Shana Mato Quran Chigwal Bandit to drink jump with to drink jump with Quran yeah, you go call leg maris and choke your call leg maris. When a Quran pick with him as a modern religion and Devin, and as a Mutum Devin, and draw a number shag marvas, meet on to Gala and the Pension Tuje, Panang with the Shing that they get a dotted to go to the room, number shagris. So just like when I tilt the flat table, the ball moves. When you break the symmetry, the test particle for you are false. You will accelerate, and this is gravity. Okay, this is what Einstein called gravity. And because all particles have energy and momentum, This gravity is universal <coughs> between all particles. Thank you. Now we talk about change of states. Charge generates change of states. But how do you know there is change of states? So an observer looks at an apple and an orange. Okay. Initially, they does not move. After a small time, they both move with velocity V. And Newton said, They are moving down because there is gravity. They are attracted by Earth. However, Einstein said, you do the experiment at Pisa Tower. If apple, orange, steel, freezer, they all move with the same velocity. Then maybe they are not moving. It's the observer who is moving. Okay? And so in the vicinity of uh, space and time, point. You cannot distinguish if there is a gravity or is the observer is just accelerating using an acceleration frame. This is called equivalence principle. And so why astronauts feel no gravity? We look at the astronaut. Astronauts are attracted by Earth and circle around the Earth. It has acceleration. Okay. But they feel no gravity. We break the translation invariance and Lorentz symmetry shall lead to gravitational force. But the interaction is such that by choosing a suitable frame at each space-time point, the astronauts feel no force at all, as if symmetry exists. Even you have interaction and break symmetry, the astronaut always chooses a frame where it feels no force, feels free and he feels there's a symmetry. This is called local symmetry, or gauge symmetry. And this special type of interaction is called gauge interaction. With this special type of interaction, special type of interaction, you can always choose a frame at each space-time point such that you don't feel any force and you are free. Okay. And so Einstein's equilibrium principle is the same as gauge symmetry. The same as saying gravity has gauge symmetry. And so by choosing a suitable frame at each position and time, the test particle feels no gravitational force, just like the astronaut. But the astronaut observes that the Earth accelerates. Okay. And so the source observer, if an observer at the source, he will naturally choose a frame where he feels no force but he saw the test particle attracted by him, by his gravity. 
in the test particle will naturally choose a frame where he feels free, she's not forced, and he sees the source accelerated toward him by his gravity force. And so this means if the interaction, like gravity, is gauge interaction, the acceleration is relative. You can, the astronaut already choose a frame, he sees no acceleration. Okay. This is called general relativity. Not only velocity is relative, acceleration is also relative for gauge interaction. <coughs> so, over the past 60 years, we learned a lot about strong interaction, weak interaction, and electromagnetic interaction of elementary particles. They all obey equilibrium principle, which means they are all in gauge interaction. Somehow, nature chooses this special type of interaction. So even when you, there is interaction, you can always find a frame called, called inertial frame where you don't feel any force and you feel free. You feel there is symmetry. You want to go back? No, I no, think that okay. the gravity so, okay, so to essentially you're explaining how the gravity force you know acts. Yeah. So um so the point you're making is that when you choose so when, when the say the isolated particle yeah. isolated particle yes. when it's on its own, it has no gravitational force. Is yes. that the point you're making? And the gravitational yes. force only emerges when it's in relation to another, another particle. No, they, mm. the, the astronaut does not feel gravity, right? Really, really. Yeah, that's yeah. because he can choose a special frame True. where he does not feel any gravity. So, Tenshuk, yeah. So, given that, I mean, gravity is supposed to be universal, so are there differences in terms of forces in gravity, say, even on the world? It's the north, north yes. and south. Yes, it's the same. Every, same. I mean, uh, uh, Yes, gravity is there, yeah. okay, there is interaction, That's for that, but it's a special kind of interaction where one, the test particle, can choose a frame that he feels no force at all, and symmetry is restored. Gravity is a particular gemare. So the gravity. So so is the Egyptian gang. So so the Egyptian so the Egyptian gang. So the Egyptian gang. So the Egyptian gang. So the Egyptian gang. So the Yes. What's the question? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are short of time. Uh, okay. Okay. We are short of time. Maybe we should discuss. Yeah. Uh, but the, 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 but the, <laughs> the equivalence of space and time yes. did not come through clearly. So that seems to be your main point. So if you can, the equivalence of space and time, yeah. that's the symmetry of space and time that yes. you're pointing out. If you can sum it up in yes. a simple way, that would be helpful. Yeah. Well, I think since we are short of time, I'll just go to the okay. conclusion. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and if we have time, we will just uh, discuss uh, maybe later. Okay. I don't have time to go through the, the quantum physics. Okay. Uh, maybe since you, you are interested in quantum physics, I should uh, spend uh, a few minutes uh, on the future of uh, quantum physics. I need to integrate quantum physics with space time symmetry. So I mentioned four features of quantum physics. The first one, of course, is superposition principle. It just says quantum fluctuation. So if a particle can be in state x1 and state x2, then it can be in state x1 plus x2, which, mean, which is the state 
where the particles switch between x1 and x2. So that an observer. Superposition said that quantum potential the particle switch between x1 and x2 is called quantum fluctuation. It fluctuates between these two states. And so the observer can find it sometime in state x1, sometime in state x2. The second feature is that every state has a phase. It's like an internal clock. Okay. The third is most important to me. There are two kinds of particles. One kind is called bosons, the other kind called fermions. Bosons, identical bosons, like to be in the same state. They like to be crowded in the same state. Identical fermions cannot be in the same state. This is called Pauli exclusion principle. So, the other particle, the other one is the atom chair, and the quarks give the quark and the quark. So, the bosons and the fermions, in relation to like quarks, where do they fit? But yeah, the bosons and fermions in relation to quarks. Oh, uh, what, where do they? The fit? level, level. In terms of level of subtlety. No, it, it's it, it's can be elementary or can be like a nuclei. Yeah, they can be both. Yeah. Atom dubs yeah. 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 So so it's a sort of basically it's a type of particle. It's a it's a category. Yes, it's a type. yes. Two kinds of particle. One kind of particle likes to be in the same state. Tamil kajar re, mandu riki kajar Oh. Yeah. Okay. And a large number of identical bosons can fall into a given state. All bosons in that state have the same phase. Okay. They are internal clock synchronized. Okay. This is called a condensate. Okay. A condensate is a rigidity. You cannot just change one of them. You have to change all of them together. Okay. <laughs> An mm -hmm. identical fermion can form pairs. Once fermions form pairs, they are like bosons. They mm -hmm. can all come into the same quantum state. Okay. So a large number of identical fermion pairs can form a condensate. Okay. And the first feature is quantum fluctuation can break. Are we, are we talking about natural states or are we talking about lab states? No, 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 it's this natural, natural state. state. You can okay. observe it, yeah. yeah. And so quantum, the first feature is quantum fluctuation can break classical uh, symmetry. But as I say, when you break classical, classical symmetry, there will be force. But this is not true in quantum physics. When you break symmetry in quantum physics, if it, there is a ground state, if you are in ground state, you will not feel force. Okay. So these are the four features. And now I go to an application of so-called macroscopic quantum phenomena. Okay. Dirac postulated that for fermions, fermions that do not, cannot be in the same state, the negative energy states are few. And he predicted the existence of antiparticle. Okay. So here you look at all the negative energy states are few. This particle has negative energy, so they shall move in time direction, move back in time direction. Okay. But Maybe since they are all few, it can be negative energy is negative side of the core. Then the then log can share with the positive and the log. Yeah. Because time is moving in this direction. For positive energy particle, you'll move in this direction. Negative energy particle will move back in time. But this particle cannot move back because there's already a particle. They cannot be in the same state. So they are forbidden. Okay. But if at some time I put in energy and excited the negative energy particle, make it positive, okay, then you have a hole. Then this particle can move here. Okay. So in the next time, the observer will move here and you see a particle and you see a hole moving. This is called antiparticle. Of the work. And so our current understanding of particle physics depends on macroscopic quantum phenomena. Current understanding of strong interaction at the scale of nucleon is based on the existence of a condensate of quark-antiquark pairs. So they are 
many, many large number of quark and antiquark pairs, they all occupy, fall into the same state. Okay. The density of these pairs set the dense scale of strong interaction. It's the nuclei scale. And we are all just bubbles. Nuclei are just bubbles in this condensate. Okay. We are just bigger bubbles. Okay. And current understanding of weak interaction is based on existence of a condensate of massless Higgs particles that carry weak charge. Okay. The density of Higgs sets the dense scale of weak interaction. Okay. So to understand the gravitational effect of these condensate and the negative energy fermion G is one of the main issues of quantum gravity. So now I move to conclusion. Physics Sorry. I move to the con conclusion. Law of inertia expresses symmetry of states. For space time symmetry, the states of an isolated particle are its time and position, its velocity, its spin, and its metric the metric for us to tell the length of, of the velocity and the angle between velocity and spin. Breaking symmetry leads to interaction. There is a class of special kind of interaction called gauge interaction, adapted by nature. It's all gauge interaction. For gauge interaction, by choosing a frame or equivalently, you redefine what do you mean by unchanged. At a given time and position, you just redefine what is unchanged. A test particle will feel no force. You feel free and feel symmetry, even though the interaction breaks symmetry. Okay. Okay. The only gauge interaction known is the interaction for a particle to emit a boson into the condensate or absorb one from the condensate. Einstein's gravity theory is very successful. This is an indication he got the essential symmetries correct. The symmetries were given in the equivalence principle and his law of inertia. That metric state of an isolated particle remains unchanged. Okay. I didn't have time to go to this uh, law, but experimental observation of the existence of the so-called dark energy and dark matter could be the first hint, could be the first hint of the breakdown of classical Einstein gravity theory. It's likely the that... Dark energy said the classical. Dark energy and dark matter said it. So can you explain yes. briefly what dark energy and dark matter is Recently, here? Recently, there are some observations that about four billion years ago, four billion years ago, or 40 billion years ago... Oh, billion years ago. Billion, yes. Yeah, the universe expansion accelerates. True. Yeah. And so that's people call they are dark energy, like pulling oh, pulling the the universe out, yeah. away. Okay. So it's a it's a, a, a energy but it has negative pressure. So it pull the oh, universe sabat. away. To your energy and the two two guru then the jumbling power cut take your in the dark energy slag which is interest now. Okay, so these are observations, observations okay? yeah. and people cannot explain, call it dark energy. And they also observe that some stars in galaxy move in strange ways, okay? so they cannot explain it and call it dark matter. So in any case, there are some observations that seems to show, they may hint on the breakdown of classical Einstein gravity theory. If there is no dark energy or dark matter, it could be Einstein's gravity is wrong. And it's likely that macroscopic quantum phenomena are relevant because only such phenomenon, a condensate, can afford a non-gauge interaction. And if you have non-gauge interaction, the equation of motion for a test particle will change. You will not obey. For gauge interaction, it's free. It just feels free. But if there's a condensate, it's no longer free. Okay. So that's the end of my talk. And uh, our next presenter, since we are out of time, <laughs> we, we cannot invite you to comment. We can invite you to comment after all the talks. Okay? So next presenter is Chen Chi Tong uh, from Academia Sinica, 
and he will talk about quantum entangling and computing. Quantum computing. Sorry. Yes. can first break for five minutes and come back. Since we are short of time, we have break of five minutes, okay? Okay. 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 So let's try to come back in five minutes. Nah, it's all right.
We are going to begin our second presentation today. <laughs> um, can you all come in now? We're going to start. Yeah. Can you all come in? Nalo Perona, Nazo Gotunye, and the Kentimbazo Nalo Perona. These are not decoration. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Cheng can start his presentation now. Yeah, um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Qi Dong Chen, and the title of my talk is an entangled world. And I uh, believe me that uh, this talk will be much easier than the previous talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the first question we uh, ask is um, what do we learn from the nature? So um, I show um, a video here that uh, shows um, the small ant. Everybody already know what is ant and you see ant already. But perhaps you uh, never see this machine it's called a robot vacuum cleaner. And so why I put a name in parallel is because um, I want you to uh, make a comparison between uh, the ant and this robot vacuum cleaner. And this comparison is made in, um, in terms of sensor, brain, and energy. Okay, so uh, we know ants has various sensors, of course, biological sensors, and but robot vacuum cleaner, it has infrared sensor, touch sensor, and so on. And for brain, I don't know if ants have self-learning function, but certainly I know that in the cleaner, we have programmable logical circuit. And energy, uh, ant is food but the uh, cleaner use battery. And in this way, we know that even nature wants to, to perform the same task as the robot vacuum cleaner. It use a totally different approach. Yeah, and so uh, the next example is, an, uh, uh, I, I, I tell you this is a fantastic example that there is a small bird called the bar-tailed goat. And this bird has, is very small. It has a weight of only 300 grams. But uh, it can fly from New Zealand to China and then to Alaska and breed. And after that, it fly non-stop on a non-stop nine-day trip back to New Zealand to their home. And so it's not that amazing. And so and we ask the question, why or if they are on the Pacific Ocean, how do they know which direction to go? So and after a long study, people start to think that they rely on the Earth Magnet, magnetic field. And so how is that do? Is the um, um, photon blue light that excites a um, certain molecule? This molecule is called the magneto reception. And this, um, well, this um, excitation gives us a superposition state that has been explained by Professor Lee previously, 
and then uh, the detail of this function will be explained by our next presenter and presenter, Professor Chen. And, but simply to say, and this triple, this uh, um, and, and this uh, superposition state contains singulator state and triplet state, and the fraction of singulator state is sensitive to magnetic field strength. And because of that, the birds know which direction to go. Okay, so um, a very uh, informatic uh, illustration of quantum mechanics is shown here using um, the photon. And we discuss about the photon polarization. And so suppose now we have a um, photon source which has an which and is an is unpolarized. That means it's polarized in all directions, and then it's a path through pass through a um, vertical polarizer, and then and then this photon will be vertically polarized, and then it's a when it's an pass through the second uh, polarizer, which is horizontal polarizer, then no light can go out. Okay, but. Uh, the funny thing is that if we insert between these two polarizers a polarizer which is 45 degrees tilted, then amazingly we find uh, that the there will be some photon coming out out of this, uh, the, the horizontal polarizer. So a um, human analogy is this one. So we have um, Batman. You, you have seen Batman uh, movie number three. Then you know that uh, there is um, the the um, Bertolus good Batman has actually contains some something of not so good Batman, uh, a a bad, a uh, uh, evil Batman. So why is that? Because um, due to the presence of this symbiote. This is a superposition state of this good better man and evil better man. Okay. And so if there is no such symbiote, then what happens is then we waste nothing. Okay. So this is just the human illustration of the superposition. And so uh, another illustration is uh, shown here. That if you look on this rotation lady, what do you think? She is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. And some says clockwise, some says counterclockwise. And but I, so, but I can tell you that if uh, you have very good conscious, then you can decide where she and rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So we ask the question, is the collapse of superposition state similar to cancer's choice? Okay. And so the other and, and illustration is shown here, that you see these two gentlemen, they look on the brick, and the left gentleman says that there are four bricks. But the right gentleman says there are three breakers. And But you, we know they look on the same thing. And so the only difference is that they look from different angles. So uh, what we learn from this, first, we know people only see what they are prepared to see. Okay. And second thing can I continue? Okay. So the second thing that we learn is that most people do not listen with intent to understand. I don't know if you, you do. And, but actually, they listen with their intent to reply. Okay, so I come to my own field on 
Un quando un computing. So according to this kind of uh, way of thinking, then you can't make any distinctions between optical illusion and veridical perception. Can yes. you? So how do you make such distinctions? Mm. <laughs> we, we, um, yeah. yeah. The, how do, well, if, if all of this is perspectively based, then how can you distinguish, you know, what criteria do we use to distinguish between a genuine optical illusion cases where we have illusions or perceptions that are real? <laughs> that is. So for example, so in, the, in, the, in this example of three brick, bricks versus four bricks, yes. so then you know, there must be something objectively a fact. Right. So the question is, are there three bricks or four bricks, and only one of the two person's perception is going to be vertical? Yeah, right. So, so the question. So because in the, in the, in the Tibetan monastic debating courtyard, Sometimes we throw a phrase saying, well, according to you, anything goes. Right. But this anything goes is considered to be a, a bad consequence. <laughs> yes, yes. So you see... And because even when we are talking about quantum physics, you know, quantum effects and so on, we are still trying to look for reality. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you see, um, in our research, we rely on the uh, measurement. The instrument, the instrument tell us if it is three or four, and we don't have conscious there because the instrument has no conscious. And so, finally, do we trust the instrument, or do we trust the experiment that we design? That is the real question. The instrument instrument I continue. So um, now uh, quantum computers. Okay, so we, we all know classical computer. The computer in front of me is a classical computer, which has a basic building block we call bit. Bit could be zero, could be one. Okay, but in a quantum computer, what okay. happens is it that... This is negative, it's a computer picture. Computer picture, you can program zero to zero, binary, ton rotate. That in the quantum computer, then in the classical denominator, the quantum computer, Okay, so uh, in a quantum computer, we don't, we, we uh, use so-called superposition state, superposition. which is not zero, not one, but it's a linear combination of zero and one. <laughs> yeah. the classical computer now, yana zero in yana one in Guru, that then the quantum computer now, yana zero in be, yana in be, yana in be, yana in be, Okay, so it's like this Schrodinger's cat. Before we open a box, the cat is not dead, it's not alive. It's in a superposition of dead and alive. I don't know if you have such cats here, but, <laughs> but, uh, but once we open the, the box and see the cat, the cat must be either die, dead, or alive. Okay, so. <clears throat> so how do we visualize in the quantum computer? So we can use this Earth model. So you see on the top, uh, we have North Pole, and we can call it, uh, say, zero. And on the bottom, we have South Pole, we call it 
point. Okay, but uh, so we can consider this is uh, the good, good Batman, the yeah. virtuous uh, Batman. Spider-Man, actually. And on the bottom, uh, the the uh, the evil Batman is living in the South Pole. Now, uh, what we are doing in a quantum computer, sorry, is that we actually work on the um, equator, where it's in a superposition state, not zero, not one. And there are different combinations, as you can see. This symbiote is in a different forms, and that is how we operate our quantum, well, we operate our quantum computer. Okay, so, um, the other key component of the quantum computer is entanglement. So and the, and if we have two high energy particles or photons that hit each other, then that will create two particles. And let's say one is spin up, and the other one must be spin down because of the spin conservation. But actually, these two particles are not spin up, not spin down. They are in the superposition state like this one. Or it could be not, it may not be up down, it could be left and right. So in any form that we never know. And so now, but remember this entanglement is robust. So even if we uh, take these two particles apart, and, and so far, so that uh, they are on the edge, the two edges, of the universe, they are. Okay, so they are still in a superposition and entangled state. But, but the, uh, the interesting thing is that if we measure one of them and find the is spin down, then the other one will automatically be spin up. Spin up. Okay, so, and so, it is, uh, so with detection, then the superposition uh, corrupts and make the choice to be a certain one. And so, uh, and, and again, a human analogy is that uh, there are a pair of twin brothers, but they don't know their name. He says, I'm in da da da. The other says, I'm da da da. And they, know, they don't know their name. So we try to figure out the name of one of them and find the. So they don't know their name. And so, and one of them says, and, free, and f find out that one of them is called John. The other one will immediately know that he's called Ben. Okay, and so that is what happens. Before the measurement, they don't know their name. And after the measurement, and they, we know their name simultaneously. And so and I don't need to explain the big Ben. And this is not my fear anyway. So, but, and, but in a big bang, in a very, very short time, say 10 to minus 30 seconds, it's already small particles like quark, electrons, neutrons, that appears. And after three seconds, they are already helium and, and, and hydrogen that appears. And then that gives light, gravity, and finally, out of 100 million years, then we started to have galaxies. And then, um, and out of billion years, then we have Earth and our human beings and all creatures. And so now, if um, we consider that, so all human beings are originally uh, from the Big Bang, we can say that. But remember, it's is entangled, okay? So now, uh, now we, saw we have so many people, not just the two, pe uh, two persons. Therefore, the entire society, all human beings, and we all interact with each other, and all interact with our environment, everything, all, are, 
all creatures, and we are all entangled. And so, and come back to the quantum computer, how do we define a number? You see, everything's artificial. We say one, two, three, four, and we add a zero, we say it's a whole number. We add negative uh, numbers, we call it an integer. And then finally, we have uh, rational, irrational numbers, and even complex numbers. Okay, so they are all numbers, but remember, this is defined by human being. So how nature does that? Nature and use a different code. It's universal. It's everything, everything that is entangled and like our society. So and now a comparison between quantum computer and classical computer. So say we have three bits, and then we know there are eight possible arrangements from zero, zero, zero to one, one, one. This is your on the left panel. And then now we wanted to find out one, one of those setters. And so we go through the classical computer process. And then this will take one by one and out of eight calculations, and we get the answer. The answer is one or one, okay. And so it's like we have um, play cards, like four play cards. We want to find, want to find uh, the, um, the heart, the red heart, Q. So what we do is we open one by one and <laughs> until we find <laughs> the card. computer <laughs> key, software program, Okay, so uh, what happens in Okay. So we're waiting for the com com quantum version of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are doing that. <laughs> okay. So um, what, what happens in quantum computer is that every bit is a superposition state. And yet there are several bits and they are in an entangled state. Okay. And so how we process it, we take a name all at once and then figure out the answer in one shot and give the answer. Okay, and the answer is 101. And that is the, uh, the, uh, the power, power, powerful part of the quantum computer. So in other words, you're saying that in quantum computer, you don't have to go through this step-by-step uh, um, -step process. No. Yeah. You do it in one go, like yes. a lump. Yes. And the answer is the same, which is the yes. answer comes out in the classical. Yeah, than sure. the quantum than the classical version to draw in a zero 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 yan zero ni than zero chicks a bunch of tama tea tama yabu yores quantum cotton draw in the gala nigga yimbe move dinner key on the gala debjilia see gabje and the angita chipotem race. Okay, but yes. I mean this is still speculation. No, this is agree. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so, so, so they, are, they are machines, they are machines. <laughs> yes. So now we know, but you see, and um, this um, bit is very fragile. So when we want to read the name, it has to be very careful. We don't want to disturb uh, all status, including this uh, superposition state, entangled, and all even final status. And so, but then in that case, how do we read it? So suppose now we have a qubit, a quantum bit, is shown on the uh, top right. Now, uh, how, sorry. So how we do that is um, we have um, something called cavity. And this cavity, uh, we put in it closer to the qubit. And so then, then they interact with each other and shows new superposition status. And so this cavity plays the law of a messenger. We wanted to to find out the qubit state, we need a messenger to tell us. So we are the person that wear uh, the suit, okay? And so 
<coughs> so in this two superposition states, we call it symmetry, anti-symmetric status. And then uh, also we call it a dressed state for some reason. And then, uh, so this is just denotation uh, of uh, those uh, status. So again, a human analogy here. So and what is the law of messenger I show and uh, using this cartoon? Suppose now we have a fisherman who cut a fish and measure the weight and final is four pounds, okay? But then, then after that, he cut the fish and even eat part of the fish. The next day, people ask him, what was the fish you caught? What, how big is it? And this fish man says five pounds, okay? So, and now the purpose is to find the, the real weight of the fish. How should we do that? The answer is we need uh, an instrument which is called light detector. Okay, and so uh, how this light detector does is it's talk to the fisherman and talk to the user. And finally, we find out the real weight of this fish. And so that is the, uh, this line detector is called messenger, okay? And so just a slide to show what we are doing in our laboratory. <laughs> so we, we use a microwave and then we have a qubit and then we have our cavity. And so, um, so we try not to disturb this uh, qubit, yet we wanted to find out the qubit state. And so, and I don't want to go to details, but just tell you that finally, with certain technique, we can realize the um, the um, virtual um, virtuous um, better man and evil better man. Okay, and even the ratio between these two. And so, finally, uh, there's um, some subjects for discussion. First, um, if the entire universe is originated from the Big Bang, then can the whole universe still remain in the anti-God state? The second question, although the human being, uh, the humans are living in the middle world, where most of the human activity seem to classically correlated, but the nature is so mysterious, and uh, we humans know so little even uh, about ourselves. So could the quantum entanglement play a role in our daily life and even inside our brain? brain. So the third question is that we already learned that the basis of the present day classical computer is very different from that of the quantum computer. So could quantum computation that simulates the function in our human brain. And would this employ a quantum state control the out mechanism saying that the messenger that can help us, us to think about mind body problem? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite your holiness for comment. <laughs> we have five minutes. Chance of Jesheti, Yeni, Piggy, the quadrophysicist, and the service there, and draw some temper. But Jesheti is an in Gotonji. So his soldier was saying that, um, you know, he was eagerly listening to your presentation on quantum physics, hoping that his understanding is going to get better and clearer, <laughs> but he's getting more confused. <laughs> 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 I try my best to make things not to be confused. So there is um, in, in Buddhist philosophy, particularly in the Madhyamaka um, philosophy and reasoning, 
there is an understanding that um, any concept you can take as an example, and if you subject that to real critical analysis, you know, because the presupposition, if you begin with the presupposition that the, con the concept is discrete and self-defined, you're never going to be able to actually find anything. So any concept, no matter how robust it is, it's going to break down. So at some point, our description and our conception of reality has to be based on some shared convention and kind of, you know, um, uh, abstraction. So His Holiness feels that perhaps some of what we are seeing may be, you know, indicating similar kind of problems. So this is why in uh, uh, classical Indian philosophical thinking, you know, both Buddhist and non-Buddhist, a distinction is drawn when it comes to description of reality between two levels of truth. One is the conventional, every, you know, level of everyday experience, where you have certain norms and criteria of validity, and then there is the deeper, you know, ultimate level of reality. So you, you know, a distinction is drawn, drawn between two levels of reality. So, you know, it becomes very clear from listening to the quantum presentations that there is clearly a big gap between our perception of the world and the actual reality of the world. So, for example, like the, the cookies that we have, um, if we were to try to find a, which one is the real cookie, you know, <laughs> is it the parts, the color, the shape, the taste, and all so we won't find a real cookie, but that doesn't prevent us or preclude us from the ability to actually enjoy and experience the taste. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> So, so when you really probe deeper into trying to find what <coughs> actually is reality the case, the ultimate truth, then you don't really find anything. So this reminds His Holiness of something that he read um, on quantum physics, an article written by a Chinese uh, physicist in mainland China. Uh, in, from mainland China, who made the observation that um, some quantum physicists, who, when, we, they, when they, because of their deep inquiry into observing reality and trying to understand reality and the complexities that they are confronting about the lack of solidity of what you can find, you know, um, it seems that some quantum physics physicists probably have a way of relating to the world that is less grasping, um, and also because of that, less emotional reactivity. I think many years ago, you see, after I uh, got some sort of, I said, uh, knowledge about quantum physics. Uh, obviously, the big differences, appearances, and reality. So then I felt, oh, those quantum physicists may have some different, sort of, different level of emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Our emotion, much based on appearances. <coughs> Uh, so a few occasions I express, uh, I'm wondering, uh, I wish someone who observe those quantum physicists, when they come across, usually we develop attachment or anger, maybe some differences. Then last, I, I think, or recently, one quantum physicist in mainland China, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, actually, I sort of really 
uh, desire that uh, quantum physicist remain on China. You see, you should participate here. Reason, what is the purpose of this sort of uh, philosophical view, or not only philosophical view, deeper understanding about the deeper, reality. Yeah, deeper inquiry into reality. Oh. Ludru Gandha, what's The judge that the Muslim, number told in Juan Sun. And it took them to Chiji law, Tebal in Juan Yus. From the Buddhist point of view, uh, one of the principal motive behind trying to understand reality and spend so much time inquiring about this is captured beautifully in Nagarjuna's writing where he says that um, our emotions such as attachment, aversion, and ignorance um, really are functions of our conceptual construction of the world. And these concepts, conceptual uh, you know, this kind of false conception of the world and these false conceptions of the world themselves are rooted in our very natural you know, desires of likes and dislikes and indifference. And therefore, you know, understanding reality is really the, the antidote to deal with the, the strong emotions. So, so when His Holiness read that article written by the mainland Chinese about you know, the quantum physicist's potential you know, lack of having, you know, uh, strong emotions, he immediately made the connection. Here you see one, what's the uh, view? Uh, one American, I think, uh, not a religious sort of minded person, I think should be a scientist. Uh, his age, you know, when I met first time, his age already 84. Mm -hmm. Uh, he helping people who too much stress because of anger. Mm -hmm. He helping over a few decades. Mm. And his conclusion is when the person develop anger, the, the object which uh, that person feel angry, uh, now mainly now here human being appears very negative but 90% of that negativeness is mental projection so that's the music I'm not talking about the social story so this is exactly what Nagarjuna was you know pointing out that a lot of strong emotions are really rooted in a false projection of the mind and this is what the His Holiness is referring to Aaron Beck the, the founder of uh, cognitive therapy, behavior therapy. Oh. Can I say something? Okay, so just uh, to reflect on uh, His Holiness's comment about wish and mind. And actually, when we look on the cake here, and we don't know which cake to choose, they are red, blue, and different colors. We don't know which one to choose. But the problem is not the cake, it's us. Because we have our own wish. I like the yellow ones better. Therefore, finally, I see the cake in different way. Therefore, in quantum and this and information, observation is so important because the observer is part of the, um, the, the the system. Yes, yes. quantum so, for example, you know, one will have to accept certain kind of, you know, of, uh, objective facts because... Mental level happiness, we, I we, think, even yes. animal, 
except that's happiness. Yes. So there's a universality yes. to certain things. <laughs> <laughs> you are holy, eh? oh. I think we need to confuse you more with the next presenter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I get the Tom Jishina. Chasha Mongu Duni, Chachen Jorba. Chachen D. Dingne, Namsha Shasha, Namsha Shasha with tea, Zakura Namsha Chi, Moruji, Penny Shasha with tea, could Chasha Ganma do to a meva. So, any Chachen Chukura does any. So, I mean, His Holiness wants to just sort of round it up. I mean, one of the observations he would like to throw here is that. Uh, yeah. So this is from the, the again the Indian um, Madhyamaka philosophy point of view that um, um, when we are examining you know attributes or effects of a phenomena, the phenomena that we observe generally tends to be something that is composed of many parts. It's a whole, yes. and the attributes and effects that we examine from the perspective of something that is whole, you know, doesn't really hold when you reduce it. And if you look at the, if you use a, a reductionist approach, then many of the attributes and effects that you can experience and observe from the perspective of whole is not retained when you are analyzing that phenomena in a reductionist way by dissecting its constitutive you know, elements. Then a lot of these attributes and effects get lost. And the positive and negative side, Tartuna, Singh, Nyoa. So similarly, for example, when we make distinctions between good and bad, you know, objectively, it's very difficult to ground that differentiation. You know, ultimately, you have to relate it to the perspective of a person or a being in, in relation to which something that is harmful or something that is helpful then you can start making kind of, you know, distinctions of good and bad. Okay, so our next presenter is Professor so Yenan Chen from National Chen Kong University of Taiwan. And he will talk about some <laughs> entangled phenomenon in biological systems. Uh, good morning, Your Holiness. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Yunnan Chen from Tainan, the first city of Taiwan, roughly 400 years ago. Okay. So it's a, a similar thing, superposition principle, quantum physics. So in classical world, no superposition, just as uh, Dr. Chen has already explained. But in Quantum physics, imagine we have a quantum particle at uh, some point of time. It could be possibly a superposition of spin up and spin down, right? Simultaneously, superposition. And uh, if you generate this uh, superposition. The superposition said, you could just go crazy. Superposition said, you can't even move up. You can't even move up. You can't even move up. だし、で、パーティクルチャットもにいたんじゃ、エネスピン、ヤンドニャンダ、マンドニャン、チョ、ヤチョニャンダ、マチョニャンニオルワ。だヤチョニャンダ、マチョニャンディアナ、だ、え
야 총년 제제 마 총년 제제 니가 임배게 내가 제 샤고 다단 포텐셜 오늘 번럼 비스 셰비 는 뭔게 켄 말로 해 떡도 간다 뭔게 배제 때 녹다 되거든 뭔게 다 풍숨 셋 풍숨 시하고 낸다고 자고 so his holiness is raising the question um, yeah. <laughs> so according to the the idea behind the superposition yeah. um, would you say that it 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 um, uh, defies the the bivalence logic and ex- the law of the excluded middle defies the logic of what the, the, the law of the excluded middle because in in the in the logic you have a bivalence logic it's either one thing or another or yeah. it is not yeah so there's a bivalence of the logic is and law of the excluded middle is an important part of that principle okay so would you say that the superposition idea in quantum physics actually rejects that or does does the violate that law okay this is very ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่ยังชุดดีใช่
If the poison trigger, then cat is dead, right? If no photon, poison is not triggered, then cat is alive, right? But as we know, this is superposition, the simultaneous with photon and no photon, right? Then this means cat is simultaneous alive and dead, right? Then the Schrodinger so, did it. ก็บางคนยังเซ็นชื่อแต่ในชโรจิงเกอร์กิชิมิเซดีวะกระดิชโรจิงเกอร์กิชิมิเซดีวะกัมจินาโรลิชิมิจูเอเนตูลันตาเ
ก็ได้ครับสอรี่เดี๋ยวสอรี่เดี๋ยวสอรี่เดี๋ยวสอรี่เดี๋ยวสอรี่เดี๋ยวสอรี่เดี๋ยวสอรี่เดี๋ยว
non-invasive measurement. That so can you explain what you mean by non yeah, Because in a quantum level, whenever we measure a particle, we always affect it, affect, yeah. disturb okay. it. But for a large particle like us, in principle, we should be able to measure particle, a large particle, without disturbing it, right? This is according to our daily life experience, right? So under these two assumptions, Sir Lege, he proposed an inequality, say, if an experiment observation violates this inequality, then that means there's a classical physics breakdown. Quantum mechanics is correct. So of course, the experiment is very difficult. But in the past decade, experimentalists had tried to, you know, some preliminary result. So they, they perform an experiment in a micro-sized uh, device. Although micro size meter is still very small, but compared to the size of electron, yeah. it's already very large, right? So they're using this device to test this inequality. You see, there's a one point, it's a green arrow, larger than one, right? This is violation, right? Good so can you explain that? Um, so what's the point? Because the violation, I mean, says that if you, have the, uh, you measure a value violate greater than one, then it's a violation of this uh, equation, inequality. Then that means the two assumptions I previously said is broken. It's not true. So it somehow means that uh, even for a larger, a bit larger size particle, it seems quantum mechanics applies, right? <laughs> Children, <laughs> So am I right in understanding that the point you are trying to make is that a lot of people assume that many of the quantum effects are felt only at the subatomic level, yes, yes. but now experiments are beginning to show yeah. that the, in fact these effects could be observed at a more macro level. Yeah. But I have to say that, uh, I mean, to be honest, there are some physicists who don't believe this experiment. There are some debate, right? But debate in science is a good thing, right? It makes and sense, progress, yeah. So, you there is The quantum gunam duty, tamu neg of Kalmato, Rabbe neg of Shatu, you have a metanic over your race. Then it's an experiment to Tony, Rabbe neg of Shatu, it's a toss and it's a sumshi drug. La, sumshi, do not have a mush gun, Sigore. Oh. Okay, so um so next is uh, main topic, quantum biology. So you can ask the question, can this uh, quantum mechanics play a role in biological system. So one of the recent hot uh, research topics is that uh, for some photosynthetic molecule, it does show some quantum coherence that means as superposition principle in this, uh, in this uh, photosynthetic molecule. And uh, that is when, when this kind of molecule, you see that the uh, elliptical shape that's an antenna. It's a function is to absorb a photon from sunlight. So after it absorbs a photon, the purpose is to transfer the excitation from the ellipse of shape to the reaction center. Right? Then between this uh, 
ellipsoid shape and the reaction center, there's a, a molecule we call FMO molecule. If you enlarge this molecule, you see these are seven side things. So before people believe that the, the transfer of this uh, excitation is a classical way, they say one, two, seven, three, then to reaction center, or one, six, five, four, three, then to reaction center, right? Classical, definite pace. But there's evidence show that uh, this excitation, when passing through this uh, protein, goes all possible ways, right? Superposition, simultaneous to pass, okay? All possible pass. Again, some scientists doesn't believe this is from man. The debate. Right. <laughs> So um, there's other observation in different molecules. So the second example is that uh, uh, Dr. Chen has already mentioned that some bird can sensitive the magnetic field. And there's a theory that uh, in the bird's eye, maybe there's some kind of molecule. It's a, for example, it's a two spin. When, when the birds fly you know, in the daytime, a solve a photon, then this creates some kind of entangled state. So this entangled state coupled with the magnetic field of the Earth. So this some complex way they can sense the magnetic field. Of course, this is a conjecture, just a theory. Now, there's no experimental, experimental evidence for the moment for this uh, uh, bird navigation things. Okay. So here comes. Uh, Okay, so since time's up, so here comes the, the end. So some, maybe some question, discussion that uh, maybe after billions of years of evolution, the nature species has already found ways to, to make use of quantum mechanics, right? The second thing is that, uh, this fundamental question, maybe somewhere in our body, we're already making use of the quantum effect. We just don't know, right? And sec the third thing is that uh, maybe it's a question, and uh, we, ha we have this uh, indefinite causal order. So how this will influence our concept in the you know, normal causality? That's the, the three questions. So I think I should end here. Okay, so thank you. OK. So, so our first presenter is Dr. Lin Zhang Yeo. So it's my turn. <laughs> my name is Xiong Lin. I'm from New York. Um, I'd like to move back quantum mechanics by 100 years to the beginning of quantum mechanics. I'd like to talk about how to use quantum mechanics to describe sunlight and what's the consequence of the descriptions to our daily life. So I'll talk about modern photonic revolution, the sun, the light bulb, and the modern photonic chips. I was born and raised in Taiwan. 
but I left Taiwan 35 years ago. It's an East Coast called Hualien. We have beautiful beaches. We also have wonderful mountains, just like here. So it's very natural. I like to talk about the sunlight and the light bulb and photonic chips. So sun is the first light. It's the engine for life on Earth. But also the sun light contains multiple colors. There is. So it's also saying that the word first again has to be relative. So in relation to our universe system, we're, galaxy, we're talking about this is the sun, first sun, the sunlight. There's limitless because, stars. So there could be these okay. are suns. That's in, true. Okay, sun so, is so, one so, of the first. So, so difficult to say. <laughs> one first, of the first. First light. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's one of the first, one of the many. Okay, one of the first, okay. <laughs> I think you should, you should use the word our sun. Okay, that's our true. Sun. Yes. Our sun, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Self center. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's a young sun. <laughs> right, 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 that's right. right. Uh, okay, um, the, the sunlight contains multiple colors from the red, the yellow, the green, and the blue. Different color has different brightness intensity, and that brightness has a distribution function, which I describe in the very bottom here. Some are stronger, some are weaker. The intensity distribution that I show in the bottom here is non-trivial. It turns out this distribution cannot be explained classically, cannot be explained by the postulates of a light as a wave. It has to be explained by light particles. Light has to be a particle. Okay. Planck used this postulate, this existence of photons, and also assume light emission and light absorption has to have a detailed balance called equilibrium. Classical with these two assumptions, light as a particles and the detail balancing, Planck was able to describe beautifully this distribution curve. The success of Planck signified the beginning of quantum mechanics. Namely, even light as a wave has to be explained as light as a particle, has a fixed energy and fixed momentum. So that's the beginning of quantum mechanics. German, uh, Max Planck, said it wrong. Yeah. German physicist, Max Planck, mm -hmm. quantum mechanics. So this is the story I'd like to share. I'd like to first introduce Thomas Edison and Max Planck. Technologically, Edison invented the little sun on Earth that we call light bulb, that generated illumination for the welfare of human beings for past century. That's the technology. Scientifically, Max Planck postulated the quantum of light called photons. That sets the foundation. He's one of the pioneers that sets the foundation for quantum mechanics. We then use quantum mechanics to describe quantized energy level in atoms, quantized energy bands in semiconductors. We then study the transition between the quantized energy level that give rise to the second light on Earth. Okay, for example, the, the lasers and LEDs. Okay. 
So I'll talk a little bit about lasers and LED and its consequence for our daily life. Recently, combining modern photonics and nanotechnology, we should be able to and we will be able to generate endless renewable energy to power the LEDs, to power the world, to generate clean water. LEDs are the same log, share message. ロックシェアとミセージソフトでゲマダメだわ。うん。このロックユーロボテトやだって、エリティテレナン。そうそう。ちょっと、ちょっと。ちょっと、ちょっと。ちょっと、ちょっと。ちょっと、ちょっと。
Yes. So can you explain okay. because the the idea that the sunlight because it is coming through this long process yeah. Yeah. of layers of yeah. air, yeah. it becomes it more effi efficient. So is it? I mean, is it similar to sort of pointing um, like a magnifying glass to concentrate the 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 sun power? Is it something like that? Um, the principles of fully absorbing light, yes. right? If you try to minimize reflection, you do not try to put something hard to it. It's almost like a sponge for light, soft landing. How do you achieve soft landing of light on Earth? You make a sponge, make it from very dilute to a little bit denser, a little bit. The gradual change soften the refraction in a gradual way. So, so it's almost like a very nice and very slow. <laughs> Similarly, we can create a gradual change when solar energy come into a solar cell, we can create a gradual change in mass density. So we start from very dilute layer to heavier, heavier layer. So they have a similarly gradual change. But this gradual change in this case happens only a micron. So we reduce the gradual change from such a long distance to a very thin layer on top of a silicon solar cell. The effect is dramatic. We can, if without this gradual change coating, the refractivity is 30%. With this gradual change, the refractivity is only 2%. Most light can get into the structure. Once light can get into the structure, we now need to maximize absorption. We also need to minimize the use of material. It turns out those are interrelated. I'll explain, and I'll probably have another five minutes to go. We lost the engine six, which is about to share. What the program has changed here in the corridor. The previous. So we now talk about a new challenge of maximize solar absorption and also minimize the use of solar material. If we assume worldwide electricity usage is 32 terawatts installed using solar cell, if we also assume state of our efficiency, which is 200 watts per meter square solar panel, you can do the math and you find the total solar panel you need is 0.15 million kilometers square, a huge area. How big is the area? It's about a fraction of Salaha Desert or a fraction of Mojave Desert. It's a huge area. If we assume a finite thickness of a solar panel of 250 micron thick, you know the volume, then you know the density, you know the weight. The total weight you will need is 100 million tons of silicon crystal. We know the global silicon production is one third of a million tons. You can do a very simple math, you find you need 300 years to do it, which is too long. So the next solution, we do need to have a new solution. The solution is to go for very thin solar cell. You reduce the thickness to very thin. But once it's very thin, it's not absorbing anymore. So it seems to be a contradictory requirement. You need to have it very thin, and yet you need to have it very efficient. So the next challenge in the next generation solar panel 
is going to be super thin and super absorbing, but seems to be a contradictory requirement. How do we do it? We need to invent and come up with a new optical principle. What are the new principles? We go back 300 years from now. Before Newton's time, we keep on coming back to Newton. It was believed light was colorless, the white light was colorless, and that the prism itself produced the color. The prism. Prism, sorry. Prism is time to hear you, Hosat. And the shade of your one. The shade is shining. The word is shining. The word is shining. The shade is so jazzing. The word is shining. The word is shining. The word is shining. The word is shining. But it turns out the prism does not produce the color. Prism simply bend the color differently for different colors of light. For example, it bends the red light a little bit less, bends the yellow light a little bit more, and bends the blue and purple much more. The extreme light bending would be in the following sense. You can take the light by bending from not to the third quadrant, but into the fourth quadrant, and actually parallel to the interface. That's the most extreme light bending one can achieve. If one can achieve this kind of light bending, light will be traveled parallel to the interface inside the material for an indefinite length without limited by the thickness of the thin film. So that would be a dream for solar absorption. Okay, here I show a cartoon and schematic of what things can happen by using nanotechnology. Sunlight will come in into this type of three-dimensional nanostructure it's going to be bended with an angle. So it's a deterministic uh, bending of light. It's not random scattering, but light will be all bended along one angle. If the angle is 90 degree, if the angle is 90 degree, it's going to be parallel to the interface. If it's parallel to the interface, then you have effectively infinite pa pass lengths within a thin film. So light can travel parallel to the interface with a very thin layer, so it can solve two problems at one time. Can that be done? The answer is yes. This has been done the past year. This is a three-dimensional image of such kind of structure. The optical design has been done. The nanofabrication has also been done. To the right, I show you an individual nanostructure. The geometrical shape acts like optical funnel to receive light fully. The arrangements of the funnel into a square array shows a square symmetry. The symmetry dictates the flow of light such that when it comes in of angle, it's always been bended parallelly inside the structure within a very thin film of 10 microns. So that can be done, has been done demonstrated, demonstrated recently. I'm going to show you a simulation results as well to show such an extreme optical effects. This is a computer simulation from a good friend of mine called Sajif Jong. This, the right hand side is showing light coming in into an optical funnel but ray arrow, a little bit small, show light is going to propagate parallelly into the interface. So there's a propagation parallel to the interface. The left-hand side, I showed uh, intense fields inside the structure 
but only within 10 microns. They have been concentrated, funneled through like a vortex of electric field within a 10 micron range. What's the consequence of it? We're able now to achieve 98% of every solar absorption within a very thin thickness of 10 micron. Okay. Seems to be impossible task, but now can be done through nanotechnology and through this new invention. Why is it a big deal? Because state of art show us we need to use a thickness of 200 micron thick before. But next generation solar cell is going to be 10 micron thick. What does that mean? The total weight that we need of a silicon is going to be reduced from 100 million tons to about 5 million tons. What does that mean? That means the global silicon production is one third of a million. That means in 15 years, if we make it into practice, we should be able to provide all the energy purely from solar panel. So we're able to, in principle, have a blueprint now to have all the energy coming in from solar power, all the 32 terawatts. So finally, we have a plan for a sustainable future through the first light on Earth and through the novel optical design. I don't know how much time I have. Your time is out. My time is up. <laughs> My time is up. Then let me go all the way. Yeah. My time is up, so let me go all the way to the very last one. Just a summary. So Let me how, just say, how, just out of curiosity, how thick is that material? The thick material yeah. can be as thin as 10 micron, so it can be very flexible. 10 micron is how thick? 10 micron, yeah. your hair is about 100 yeah. micron. Micron, micron. So yeah. one tenth of yeah. a hair. Yeah. Uh, um, mm. uh, so it can be very thin. Very thin, yeah. yeah. Uh, let, let me summarize this because I'm out of time. The impact, I'm happy to share with you, of optics and photonics as a result of quantum mechanics have many impacts to every corner of our daily life. Biomedical applications such as laser knife, such as skin treatment is very useful now. Energy application is very huge. Hydrogen production water desalinations, solar cell. For environment, is also very powerful. All the pollution detections, cloud thickness determinations. Information science is clearly, all the displays is the consequence of optics in modern photonics. Automation, the drilling, machine vision, laser cutting, very powerful CO2 laser now, being used to benefit mankind very quick, uh, very nice cutting. Also basic science, the laser spectroscopy, the laser tweezers, the nonlinear interaction, and so on. So the quantum mechanics, light, and optics has been a very in instrumental uh, uh, aspect of it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Now I invite your holiness to make the concluding remarks. <laughs> <laughs> if you feel hungry, we can go <laughs> have lunch. <laughs> no, nothing. Oh, really? Wonderful. Those are the day. Dr. Singh did some shoes down, sir. Yeah, the researchers, they've really thought deeply. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. As I mentioned at the beginning, now more research work on how to reduce anger. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. <now. laughs> Truly. It's a today's world. I think rule of anger is much stronger than rule of compassion. That must change. Quantum physics is <laughs> 공주의 시야와 난 누구 쉬우신 연구도 가네
Yeah. So while we are all, you know, inquiring about quantum physics, but in the day-to-day -day life, what gives us a lot of problems is really about the strong emotions <laughs> causing a lot of difficulties. At a global level, I think really, really very sad. This very moment, we enjoy peaceful. But meantime, hundreds of people killing and facing starvation. Particularly those children in Yemen. They done nothing. The soldier with weapon, there's some maybe some reason to eliminate them. But those children but dying. So that's today's world. And the religion itself now making more division and killing. Really very sad. So I hope more and more scientists, as I mentioned before, you see the, you see the after sort of research work, then finally, yeah, we human beings, all these sort of knowledge in human mind, not animal mind. Uh, now this knowledge, uh, I think we should have one aim, goal, not just to uh, develop a new idea and some article, then get some name. name. So um, the, the, the motive behind scientific inquiry should not be just confined to, you know, just innovation, finding new things or getting your name and so on, but we need to have always maintained the bigger picture. What is the goal of scientific mm -hmm. inquiry? Yes. Okay. So if world, yeah. is it too much violence? Uh, yes. And then finally, the scientists also suffer. <laughs> we are part of the humanity, isn't it? Sir. I think we should take the well-being of humanity. humanity. And the religious people also, you see, think that. Not just my religion, my religion, not like that. Think uh, how to build uh, the happy humanity, peaceful world. So scientists, as I mentioned this morning, I think really uh, I quite, quite influential in the society. So you also should think about how to achieve a happy world and how to reduce this what's the suffering, suffering of human creation. They are quite sufficient uh, due to global warming a lot of problems. Now, uh, it is senseless on the be on beside the natural. natural sort of problem, disaster. We also, you see, add, uh, more, yeah. add more problem. Very sad. Now I invite Professor Taikidi to say a few words. Well, um, I agree with what you said. You know, Orin has just said about humanity, what we should do. I just want to mention that the, when we said Max Planck uh, invented quantization, actually, at that time, scientists tried to understand the break body radiation, like something's open in the open when the firewood was burning, we do see some radiation, some distribution. At that time, classical mechanics could not explain why the wavelength distribution should have a peak and go down. And so one newspaper was um, having a competition, said, how can you explain the break body radiation? Max Planck didn't really know quantization. He only knew that the, in, in 
explaining the break body radiation, he has to put energy in proportion to the frequency. So energy we have to exchange in a unit of certain quanta. quanta. So actually, the curiosity try to understand the break body radiation necessitated him to put the energy in a quantum form. So that was the, uh, the start of the quantum mechanism. Classical get on the job to your maris, maybe in San Sawachi get on in Tendruce, that it is a job to your suit and never taking his lapse. The children, Max Planky, the Shejabe Kablaya, Kantachi energy, the frequency in your room, Dewey was you to an ashamed in Dugala, and the quantas head, her in Dugal Tum Tum, you were never is according to. So very often teachers want to teach children to be creative, innovative. Creation, innovation is really not coming from nowhere. Most often it's a curiosity in trying to understand certain things and pursue the answer. Then you find something new. That's true. The curve is the reality. Yeah. No one can do it, non-classically. Yeah. Someone has to postulate something. Planck was so clever, so creative. Yeah. He said, energy must be quantized into discrete levels. Yeah. I, I don't think the Max Planck was so creative, so smart. He just turned out that the if he want to fit the, fit the curve, he just put the energy in the quanta. He didn't know why. He didn't really know why. <laughs> okay. Max Planck, the energy in the world, the Max Planck wrote a book on black body radiation. I read it. Almost every chapter, he reiterate, I have to quantize the photon. <laughs> okay, so I think time is up and this session is closed. We have a break for lunch. Thank you.